It was during the First World War that the term conscientious objector was first coined to describe those who wouldn't fight. World War II saw men reject violent conflict too. So, who were these men and why wouldn't they do what was considered at the time to be the right thing? Felicity Goodall is the author of A Question of Conscience, which tells the stories of some of those who refused the draft. 20,000 British men were killed on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. It became quite clear that they would need to force people to join. So on March the 2nd, 1916, they introduced the Military Service Act and men had no option but to go and fight. Now, of course, they hadn't actually thought anyone would object. Why would they? There were people who felt their conscience wouldn't allow them to go to war and kill another human being. So these guys had a moral stance, but how did the authorities take it? The British Army did not know how to cope. Here were people who wouldn't obey orders. They couldn't see why these men wouldn't fight, they just thought they were cowards. About 6,000 of them were basically sent to prison, most notoriously Dartmoor. It was a terrible experience for them, although of course a lot of people would say not as terrible as going to the trenches. In the interwar years, official attitudes softened and when World War II broke out in September 1939, more men were exempted from fighting. But the public view was rather different. Peter Rutter was a conscientious objector during World War II. So when you had to go and sign up, what happened? I just assigned the appropriate section of the papers that came to me when I'm on my 18th birthday to say that I wanted to register as a conscientious objector. I went before a tribunal in Bristol and I found that the chairman of the tribunal was a man called Judge Weatherid. And as soon as he read my statement, he said, this is the kind of statement that makes me feel sick. And then went on at about 10 minutes length in a very inflamed sort of way. What made you become a conscientious objector? Well, I come from a Quaker family, um, and way back, right from the inception of Quakers, which is just over 350 years ago, they were set against the use of violence in any form, and certainly against going to war. I joined the Friends Eminence Unit. I just wanted to do something positive. And then we got ready to go out to Europe to, as, a, as a relief team. And from that point onwards, um, we moved up with the front line. 22 of our chaps uh, didn't survive, but uh, that's war, yeah. We were deputed to help some of the survivors from Auschwitz. There was a girl there called Judith Shalomon from Romania. She was 12 and a half years old and she weighed just over two stones in weight. It was like looking at a skeleton with skin stretched over it, and I didn't think she'd survive. Only 12 years ago, I received a visit from Judith and her sister, wanting to find me and telling other people that I'd saved their lives, and I had to tick them off, really. I hadn't saved their lives. I don't know what anyone else would do to help look after them and restore them to health. But seeing all of that, did that ever shake how you felt? No. No, it doesn't, because, and I mean, if you feel strongly enough about things, you're prepared to stick by them because you feel they're right. We haven't faced conscription in this country for three generations. But if Britain was faced with invasion and people were once again called upon to fight, what would you do? Dan's here to tell us, aren't you, Dan? I mean, this term came about during the First World War, didn't it? Yeah, first of all, the problem with the First World War, you need loads and loads of guys to fight. So you, you had to, basically everyone of military age had to go and, and put themselves forward. And that meant that some of these people didn't want to fight, of course, uh, including this guy, Fenner Brockway, who um, became a Labour minister. Um, but he did spend a lot of time uh, in, in prison during the First World War. And it, people like him were uh, verbally abused, often physically abused for not wanting to fight. Because, of course, all this bloodshed on the battlefields, people, the passions were running high. But we think of objectors, we think of people who didn't contribute, but it's not necessarily the... Yeah, I mean, the thing stories. is that some people just refuse to do anything, and they usually end up in prison. Uh, some people said, well, I'll go and I'll be a coal miner, I'll work on the land, agricultural, you know, those kind of things. And then some people, like that wonderful man in, in the, the piece there, 
agreed to drive ambulances or carry stretchers, and that was incredibly dangerous. Charging around the battlefield, carrying wounded people off it, could be as dangerous as anything on the front line. So, um, you know, it, 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 it's, a big, it's a big term. It covers a lot of different activities. Mm. There are a lot of there's famous names as well that you can put onto the list. Well, I guess, I mean, yeah, one of the most famous probably Muhammad Ali, of, yeah, course. of course. Cassius Clay, as he was earlier on. And in 1964, he refused to go to the Vietnam War, he refused to fight in Vietnam, and he was stripped of his world title and spent time in prison and, and banned from boxing, which was later reversed. But uh, even, actually, nowadays, you wouldn't think it, but there's still um, a guy called Lance Corporal Joe uh, Glenton, who is actually in military custody at the moment. There's a picture of him. And he's refused to go to Afghanistan. He's in the army. So it's an ongoing thing. Mm. Okay. Did you 